was very darn cool. Had anybody else ever heard him speak before? I had you know, This was a first for me. I've heard people doing similar processes, but his approach was pretty cool. Um, let's see. What is the time? Quarter after. Okay. So, what we're trying to do with this, a little bit about me, just so you know who I am and what I do. My name is Austin Smith. Um, I'll be speaking to you today about raising meat rabbits, particularly on a small scale, as an alternative to grocery store meat. If you want protein that you can raise yourself, but you don't have the space to graze cattle or hogs or anything, raising rabbits as an urban livestock, essentially. And just my history, I've been raising rabbits for two years, which it might not sound like a lot, but when you're dealing with live animals that breed quickly, you learn a lot very fast. Um, you you kind of have to. And rabbits, they're fun. They have their own little quirks to them, but they're not the most complicated animal out there to take care of. And I'm one of those people that likes to do my homework before I jump into something most of the time. And so I did a lot of reading about rabbiting. Well, not rabbiting, that's a bad habit. Because rabbiting is actually hunting rabbits, which is not what I do. But, uh, before I got into this, I grew up in Iowa City. I didn't really know about sustainability. It wasn't really that important to me. And I ended up, thank you, sir. I ended up, right after high school, I graduated high school in 2008, and so you don't have to do the math, that makes me 25 years old. Um, and I joined the Army straight away on active duty, and I mention that because that's kind of where I learned to value self-sufficiency, and it wasn't actually while in the Army. I enjoyed survival skills and stuff like that. They have good practical use. But when I got out, I came straight back up here and started school. And I really felt the effect of having pretty much my entire life dictated by somebody else. And it's somebody else providing for me to a standard I have no control over. So I got very interested at first in self-sufficiency as a lifestyle. And that is very similar to sustainability. And so I started learning more and more and more. And as I did, I found out how crucial it is that we practice things to say me and that we take an objective look at the way people live. And I don't have any farming experience whatsoever. I was a city kid for 18 years. But I want to get into it and that's my dream is to have something like what Mr. Tiki was showing us. And so this is how I'm starting because I don't have an English. And rabbits are great for it. Um, if you're not familiar with rabbits as a food source, nowadays people are generally against it because they're cute and they're fluffy and they come out every year to advertise for Cadbury chocolates for Easter. And they've actually been a food source for an extremely long time throughout the world. And in the United States, they were a prevalent food source in America and in the United Kingdom during World War II because they were not a rationed food item for the general populace. And they take a small amount of space, a small amount of input, and they proliferate like crazy. I mean, come on, we've all heard it. And it's completely true. Um, but people would raise rabbits on their own. And then it just it fell out of style with convenient, cheap, industrialized meat production. But now people are kind of getting back into it. So that's what I want to talk to you about. In case you're curious or you're interested in doing it, I'm going to try and help you understand what it takes and where to get started. So if you have questions, please feel free. Uh, I just ask that you raise your hand before you shout out. So if I have a point, I tend to forget where my trains of thought are. So if I let them jump off the tracks, I may never find them. So there are pros and cons to raising meat rabbits. Your pros, as I said, it's not unheard of. It's just kind of a strange thing to most people in the States. But if I talk to somebody that has experience living outside of the US, especially over in Europe, 
the first thing they think when I say I raise rabbits, they say, oh, you mean to eat, right? And I say yes. When I say that here, that's the last thing people expect. And when I tell them that, they kind of give you this face like you're this terrible person. Why would you ever hurt such a fluffy animal? And we'll get to that. Um, but another thing is if you decide to grow commercially, or you want to try and sell just you have a couple extra animals that can't fit in your freezer. You don't have to have a USDA health inspection to sell rabbit meat. It's considered an exotic meat right now, like bison or elk. You don't have to have it checked. Now, most people do because it's a courtesy and there are protocols for checking rabbit meat. But if you don't, you're not going to get slammed as hard as if you just sold beef that wasn't inspected. The meat itself is very, very healthy. Uh, and we'll get to the point that at times it's a little too healthy. There is such a thing. It's very low in cholesterol. It's high in extremely necessary proteins. There's a reason that most predators in the world eat rats. And they try to eat a lot. So the, the danger with that, I'll go ahead and skip over, is there's something called rabbit starvation. And this does not imply that the animals themselves are short of food. This is an issue that some Native American tribes were observed, observed to find, and some early Western settlers up in the Rocky Mountains during the winter, rabbits were generally the easiest thing to just set a snare, come back, eat it. Where there is so little fat in rabbits naturally, unless you purposely fatten them when you domesticate them, that your body has a protein. It has too much protein. It can't break it down. There's not enough fat to intermix, and you end up with multiple nutrient deficiencies. And all you want to do is keep eating, keep eating. But when all you can find is rabbit, you just keep eating more rabbit. And eventually, you die of uh, nutrient deficiencies. So, uh, especially like the early Vikings actually uh, saw Native Americans in the northeastern states and into the west, eastern Canada that would have these huge bellies for the rabbit, but they were starving to death. So you have to be careful of that. Nowadays, it's not such an issue for us. All you have to do is eat a balanced diet. You just get your fats from somewhere else. But it's worth mentioning, because some people have heard of it, and they bring that up when I start discussing rabbit meat. And if you decide to go a larger scale, try and sell, Many of the trending lifestyles and diets right now on the market, rabbit is very agreeable to. Paleo diet, you eat only natural, like what cavemen eat, or I guess ate, because there aren't really that many of them. <laughs> like slow food, real food, do it at home the way we've done it for centuries, instead of McDonald's all the time. Great, it is, that is one of my favorite things about rabbit. And you, when you pay attention to it, it makes the fact that you raise it yourself that much better. And then, local food. I mean, you don't, it doesn't have to be local, but it's very easy. I mean, if you know somebody that raises rabbits, they're usually very passionate about the animal and its products. And so they're willing to keep it within an area and help introduce other people to the meat, as I'm doing today. I don't have any meat to sell you, but I just want you to be aware. Cons, local laws. Most places that have any kind of ordinance banning animal breeding it's not all. You have to check them. I'll tell you right now, Cedar Falls does not allow them. Waterloo will. I believe you need a permit. That I, from what I understand, you can individually request exceptions from the Cedar Falls City Council. Um, but when I first got started, I was living in Cedar Falls and I was super excited because I read the legislation and it said nothing about rabbits. It had ostriches, emus, llamas, and it said none of those. So I was like, sweet, no mention of rabbits, I'm good. Got my rabbits about a year later, I reread the law and it said, or any other animal used for agricultural purposes. So, like, so you kind of have to know what your restrictions are. I'm not going to encourage it, but I will say it is an option if you are willing to accept the consequences of a civil act of disobedience. All options on the table, that is one, just be prepared. Cities handle them differently. Poorly tended rabbits do smell. They produce a lot of poop and a lot of bee and very large and frequent quantities. And so if you don't clean it regularly, your neighbors might take notice and take offense. And if you're raising them for meat, surprise, surprise, you're gonna have to kill an animal. You're gonna have to kill more than one. 
unless you try it and it's not for you, and that's fine. That happens to a lot of people. But I'll talk a little bit more about the mindset that I found that helps with that part of it, because to a lot of people, that's the biggest intimidator. And then allergens, if you're allergic to animals, or particularly dander, um, I know one person who is allergic to a protein in animal saliva, so it's, it's a very rare allergic issue, but it's very severe, so you can't have dogs, but rabbits are fine because rabbits never lick you. you. The only time you ever see a rabbit tongue is when they yawn, which, by the way, is terrifying. If you have never seen a rabbit skull before, it looks like something is coming from the deep abyss to try and eat. <laughs> and then we discussed rabbit starvation. So those are a lot of the major things to consider if you're curious and looking into it. But beyond that, the kind of the benefits instead of why, but some of the benefits that you find. You have recreational benefits. I am currently an undergraduate student here at UNI, and I'm studying outdoor recreation. So the recreational benefits of this are not lost to me. You have your general recreation. You get to go outside if you raise them outside, or you take them out to play if you keep them inside. You get to do things like, this is me building a rabbit tractor last year. And it introduces you to all sorts of other activities, like uh, carpentry or tanning, which is my first attempt. You can hear it pop. I didn't do as best I could have. But is, would anybody like to see these at all? I can pass these around as well. So we'll pass those out. And there's also a therapeutic value to rabbits because they're cute, they're cuddly. You don't kill them all, you need breeders. So people get surprised when I name my rabbits. I only name the ones that breed because I want to keep them alive. I want to have that long-lasting relationship with them. But that doesn't mean I give any less attention to the friars that we're going to harvest. But, like, this is, by and large, our nicest friend. In case you're not aware, uh, this is my fiance Lauren, who's videotaping this, for, uh, to share with the group that I will discuss later. And she's just a sweetheart of a rabbit. But for somebody like me, who, uh, I'll be open and honest, I have particular anxieties, some of which come from my background, some of which do not, but being responsible for another life form, like directly responsible, is amazingly calming when you have moments like this. This was after trimming nails, but it was just so fun and relaxing that it, it, you'd be remiss to overlook it. And then also there's competitions, even if you don't want to eat them, another thing, you can have fun. They, they have rabbit shows where they weave between the cones and go up A-frames, just like dogs do. They're hilarious. <laughs> you can look them up on YouTube. There's tons of videos. Um, and then the obvious products you can get from rabbits. You get your food. This dish pictured up here was my Thanksgiving meal last year. It's one of the rabbits stuffed with cornbread stuffing, local sweet potatoes, and um, I don't think they were local, but they were organic, dried, Pinto beans from IV. And you slow cook it and it's amazing. You can season it however you want. When, at least mine, my, my experience with domesticated rabbit meat, a lot of people are concerned, is, is it going to be gamey? I don't like that gamey taste because that's what people think of when they think deer or anything. You, you find out in the wild that we don't normally domesticate meat, which that's more based on the animal's diet. So domesticated rabbits don't really have that flavor. Ours are actually quite mild. They taste like, similar to chicken, but even, even more mild than the flavor that chicken has. It's, it's very flexible and very adaptable, so if you like to cook, that's another skill you can develop. And you can cook rabbit pretty much the same way as you cook a chicken. You can fry it, you can slow cook it, just, it, it matches pretty much everything else. And then, you can also raise them for fiber. As you see, I have pellets. I intend to actually do things when I am decent at tanning, and they're not stiff and crinkly. But this is a particular type of breed called an Angora. If you've heard of Angora wool, it doesn't just come from sheep or llamas. You can get it from rabbits, and you shear it. You don't slaughter the animal and skin it. So that's another opportunity, even if you're not 
super huge on meat. If you're a vegetarian, rabbits can still be for you. And you can still, you, you can't make as big a living off of it because you need a huge space to raise a marketable amount of wool from angoras. But it's still an option for like a hobby income. <coughs> and besides that, uh, fertilizer. I'm not going to show you a giant picture of rabbit poop, don't worry. Um, if, if you've never seen rabbit poop, it comes in a little pellet about yay big. And it's, when it leaves their body, it's pretty much dry. And if it's not, it will dry out within minutes. And it is, from everybody I've heard that's used it in their garden, in my limited experience using it in my garden last year, it is hands down the best manure you will find to fertilize a garden. And the reason for that, rabbit digestive systems are extremely inefficient. They're terribly inefficient at absorbing and breaking down foodstuffs to the point where it's not uncommon for rabbits to eat their own poop. It sounds gross, but there's still stuff they can take away and redigest in there so that they can stay alive if they can't find food otherwise. And that's why it's so good. There's still plant fiber in there if they eat a plant-based diet to help amend soil. There's all the nutrients of manure that's supplemented with more intact dead plant matter that has not already been digested and broken down. So that alone is a good reason to keep rabbits. You can sell that and avid gardeners will pay for it because they know that it's good. I haven't pursued that enterprise yet, but it's something I'm holding on to for the future. I wish I had one of those little clickers like Mr. Tiki had. That'd be so much easier. And then you can, they're a great educational opportunity. You can get kids interested in animal science and agriculture at a young age and doing it in a sustainable practice. You can get them interested in 4-H. Rabbits, rabbit breeding, rabbit showing are a huge part of 4-H groups. Have been for years. You can learn biology, the makeup of the animals, how their digestive tracts work, how their breeding works, and that transfers into genetics. They breed fast and they breed a lot. You get a lot of babies. The average size of litter for most rabbits is between six and eight. So you get a lot of genetic variation very quickly. So you can play with that. You can create new breeds. You can just be curious. And it's it's just so much fun. Like our our does that we have are sisters of the same breed. And our one buck is not related to them at all, not the same breed. His breed is very strange and we'll get to that later. But their their face shape is very different. Our does have very narrow faces. He looks like a Neanderthal, just this huge, blocky, square head. And both of those show up in the babies when they're like three weeks old. You can already start to tell their ear shapes, their f this, the amount of fur they have on their feet, which parent. It's super fun, and it, it is trackable if you're familiar with genetics. You don't need a lot of complex machinery to look at the genes. You can just see how it progresses, and it's really fun, which is more of her department. So if you're curious about that stuff, she's better to talk to. And, let's be honest, it's just fun. I mean, these are a litter of, oh, I want to say there are four or five. And they're like, uh, about three weeks old. So they're just learning to move. And if you look, this is in a plastic tub that you find in PetSmart with a box that I made out of recycled pallet straps. That's all you really need until they get bigger. And they're just fine. And they're a joy to just sit and watch and move around. You don't have to bathe them. They clean themselves like cats and it's freaking adorable. And I don't mind using that word because there's no other word to describe it. Some people see it as an unmanly word. I don't really care. <laughs> but it's, it's so much fun just to watch them play and socialize when they're little. And if you keep them into adulthood, when they mature, they develop personalities that are so starkly different. One of our does is kind of antisocial. She prefers to be left alone. One of our does, the one that I showed, her name is Jane. Jane Go. Yes, that was intentional. Um, she, she will eat anything you give her. She loves food. It doesn't matter if there's still food in her feeder. If you give her more food, she's going to wig out and be so excited. And then our buck, he has this strange obsession with water. You pour water in his bowl, and he does the same thing as Jane does. He just goes nuts. It's crazy. But you learn that stuff the more you interact with them. And that's, to me, that's half the fun. It's just getting to know your animals. But if you want to get into it, what do you need? You need shelter for them. And if you're doing a cage, 
like is in the upper right, it's highly advised that there's a space for them to run and play because they need room to exercise. Because rabbits, if they don't exercise, they do build up fat. And since their their genetic makeup is not made for them to be a fat dense animal, it, they're prone to heart problems very easy, and they're easily stressed. They, for some reason, they tend to think everything out there is trying to kill them. And so, if if you have an overweight rabbit. Um, one of the problems you run into is if they're not socialized enough or they don't get time to exercise in a larger space than this cage, if they get scared, they can scare themselves into a heart attack and die. I mean, they can do that even if they're in good shape. That's the main reason why I haven't brought any rabbits here today. I would be willing to carry one of my rabbits around all day and let you all see them, but I was afraid of getting them here because you have to kind of be aware of what makes them afraid. And we'll, we'll discuss these different types of shelter and keeping areas that you can look into because they each have their ups and downs. Then you have to give them food, of course. Um, we'll get to that. There are a couple different options for food. They need water. Water is pretty easy. You can get bottles from a pet store if you've only got a couple of them. You can get bigger bottles for litters that they can share. You can get bowls. We have heated bowls right now because uh, we don't have them outside. We have them in the garage so that they're outside, but it's, it's warm in there and it's sufficient for them and they have heated bowls so it doesn't freeze. Hygiene tools, you need a brush, you need some nail clippers. That's about it for hygiene, they take care of the rest, but you need to clip their nails regularly because otherwise they're just like dogs where the nails get too long and it grows and their digits start to get manipulated and twisted because they can't set their feet down flat. And it's a big health problem. It kind of stinks when you're the one that does it if you've fallen behind, as I have done and you try and clip their nails, if they're not used to it, they fuss, and they have sharp nails, and hence you get one of these on the back of your hand, or your forearm, or wherever. And it will go through clothing. I've been scratched through bed. So that's another motivation to keep on top of things. Uh, I've made a lot of mistakes in my first couple months at this. And then, just small amounts of daily time. If you plan to get into it commercially, you might want to invest in a tattoo gun. It's not like you see when you go to the hill and you get inked there, but it's, it's more of, not even a gun, it's more of a press, and you just mark them with a number on the inside of their ear so you can track each individual, in, each individual animal if you start scaling up to a larger thing. So you can track weight gain, you can track age, you can track who's the sire or <coughs> name of this rabbit, uh, all these things, it's just easier that way for record keeping. We don't have one right now, we don't have that big <clears throat> operation. We're hoping someday to be big enough to where that is something we need to invest in. Are there any questions up to this point? No, because I, I will have time at the end as well. So, the different types of shelter, you have cages. For a medium-sized rabbit, they recommend at least a 36 by 36 inch cage. Um, it, I've kept them in cages, I don't particularly enjoy it, but when that's all you have, that's all you have, and it's better, it's still better for you and your family than going to the store and buying who knows what went into that hog. So you kind of got to consider your options, but like I said, this is fine as long as you have some exercise space for it. What I did was I went and bought one of those like plastic dog pens that you set in your house so your dog can't get out, it's about eight tall. It's like feet long, three or four feet wide, whatever, and you set them in that and they're great. They love it. They'll run in there all day. And that's what it means, set them in there for 10 or 15 minutes and then put them back. That's, that's the exercise they need if you do that like twice a week. You're good. So they're cheap, they're very easily available. You can make your own. If you want to do something different than this, you can go buy your old wire and some wire cutters at farm and fleet and make your own. That's what we did. We bought one of these and we made one of our own. And it worked pretty well for us to begin with. You can also do bigger setups like this where you, you have collection systems underneath to collect the manure and the urine that they got. So you can't, you may not be able to see it, but like here they dip down together and drop down a PVC pipe. And so you can insert a collection tub or something like that to collect it. Some people do this over a uh, worm bin. So you can throw your food scraps under the rabbit cage, you can feed 
certain food scraps to your rabbits from your kitchen or your garden, and then they just drop it all back down into the worms, and you don't have to move a thing. And so that's another option you can do. But if you buy them, they're pretty uniform, they stack together nicely as you can see here. You can expand or decrease size as needed, they're very modular, and you don't have to do much to collect waste. Even if you only have one cage like this, you can buy a $5 Tupperware tub and just slip it underneath and it's going to collect everything you need, and you're fine. The, thing, the main thing to watch out for though, besides exercise, is hawk sores. The hawk is, when you buy a lucky rabbit's foot, usually what you're buying is the hawk. It's that big, long part of the back foot. That's what lays flat most of the time. They get sores on their feet if they're on nothing but cage, unless they have extremely furred feet, then they don't encounter it so much. But those can get swollen, they can get infected, and so that's one of the major cons in my eyes to this type of system. Even if you just put like a piece of plywood in there for them to sit on, they'll identify it and they'll rest on it often, and that, that alone can usually just make it go away. It'll heal itself. And then the other thing, rabbits are very social. Even if they're not interacting with you as a person, they like to interact with each other. And when you keep them in a cage like this, they can't interact very well. And so they get kind of used to being solitary. If you put them together to play, they're more prone to fight if they're of the same gender. And if they're not of the same gender, they tend to do other things. So it's it's not as conducive to imitating the natural life of a rabbit, if that is an emphasis for you. So after that, very similar in a lot of ways are hutches. They're usually bigger, um, a little bit more expensive. And you can buy them like this from Farm and Fleet. I have one that's larger than this, and it does fine. Waste collection is easier because there's a tray underneath that you just slide out, and it has all the in Yes, sir? I've often wondered, and I'm not sure if you know the answer to this, can rabbits cohabitate with other animals like chickens, for example? Have you ever heard of that, or do you know of any issues that would arise? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I've, yeah, the, the chickens, from what I've heard, can pick on the rabbits a little bit. Um, that brings up a good point, though. If you keep your rabbits in cages or in a setup like this, and you keep chickens in the same area, there are a lot of people, uh, if anybody here has ever heard of like Joel Salatin, and follows Polyface Farms. They do a lot of really cool stuff and very, uh, I don't know what's I can't think of it, but very new stuff in the world of sustainable and restorative agriculture. And one of their things they do is they suspend rabbit cages in a hoop house during the winter above chickens. And what that does, all the waste goes down. The chickens peck through it and disperse it because chickens are not susceptible to rabbit diseases. Rabbits are not susceptible to chicken diseases. So all of your pathogens, your bacteria, they get super confused and they tend to die. He's been doing it that way for like 20 or 30 years and has never had a health problem from that setup. But directly putting them together, I've never witnessed it, but I've heard that the chickens can tend to be aggressive because chickens need protein. If you don't give them a regular protein feed and they're a free-range chicken and they've been struggling, they might turn on a rabbit. Or rabbits can be territorial if they, if a, especially a an aggressive pregnant doe feels like she's being encroached upon, she'll chase chickens out, or she'll die trying. So it's, it, they're good together if you keep them separate. They, it's, it has some uses. That's a good, a good use of a cage system. And like a hutch like this, they're nice because you can buy them in the store. You can buy them big, and this one has a run, so you don't need anything separate. You can buy them small, you can make them yourself. I've done these two. I haven't bought them one yet. But they're, they're pretty nice. You still have a lot of the same risks. You have hawk sores. If you have a smaller one, you still want to get them out to play and exercise. But there are a ton of designs available for hutches. You can get them pre-made or if you Google like DIY.